In the landmark text Hamlet's Mill, authors Giorgio de Santillana and Herta von Decken declare that, quote, the story of Samson stands out in the Bible as a grand tissue of absurdities. They examine some of the episodes of the Samson story to argue that, like other myths around the world, it is part of a great worldwide archaic construction, a vast ruined framework upon which, quote, the dust of centuries had already settled when the Greeks came upon the scene, in which the motions of the heavens are somehow encoded within the stories, working on many levels and all of it connected. This ancient worldwide system underlies not just the stories of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, such as the Samson story, but also the stories of the New Testament, as well as the ancient myths, scriptures, and sacred stories of cultures literally around the globe, from ancient Egypt, ancient Sumer and Babylon, ancient India and further east as well, the ancient Greeks, the Norse, and aspects of it have survived into modern times in the sacred stories and traditions of the peoples of the Americas, the Pacific, uh, Pacific Islands, Australia, Africa, and parts of Asia. Once we begin to understand how this vast ancient worldwide system works, we will see that the story of Samson is only a quote, grand tissue of absurdities if we try to read it literally, that is, if we read it as if it were meant to describe literal events in the life of a historical earthly character named Samson who had great strength that was lost when Delilah cut his hair. When understood as part of that ancient system which underlies all the world's ancient myths, the Samson story has a very coherent message. Like all the other ancient myths, it is based on the motions of the heavens, the sun, moon, visible planets, and specific constellations. And like the other ancient myths, it uses these to convey to each of us an extremely profound message. The first episode in Samson's life, other than the events leading up to the birth of Samson, which I believe to be based on a different set of specific constellations, is found in the book of Judges chapter 14, where we read that Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines, and he told his mother and father, she pleaseth me well and he wants her for his wife. So then we read that Samson went down to Timnath and encountered a young lion who roared against him. And then Samson rent the lion as he would have rent a kid, a young goat. He tore it apart with his bare hands as if it was just a baby goat. Then he went down to talk with the woman and she pleased him well. We're next told in the scripture that after a time he returned to take her and turned aside to see the carcass of the lion and behold there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. The authors of Hamlet's Mill mention this episode briefly and note that it has echoes in other myths such as Heracles or Hercules slaying the Nemean lion with his bare hands, or bees coming from a carcass in ancient poems by Virgil, for example. But unfortunately, they don't go all the way to explaining it, which is very characteristic of Hamlet's Mill as a whole. Samson actually turns these events into a riddle in the scripture, challenging the 30 companions that his mother and father invite to a feast to explain these events. He challenges the 30 companions in a riddle. Can you explain what this means? This is very interesting because it's a challenge to us as well. What do these events mean? The order and direction, so to speak, of the story is very important to perceiving its meaning. As the sun moves through the year, it rises in successive 
houses of stars, the background stars that are above the horizon and which are visible at the point above the sunrise as the sky grows lighter and lighter each dawn. These background stars at the point that the sun rises will always be in the zodiac band of stars. And as we go through the year, they will follow a specific pattern. It so happens that this story tells of Samson progressing first to a lion on the way down to a woman, which is what the sun itself does each year after passing the highest point of summer as the months begin to decline down towards the fall equinox. At the fall equinox is the sign of Virgo, which is the beautiful woman, and just before that is the sign of Leo, the lion. But what about that swarm of bees that are there when Samson comes back after some time has passed? That corresponds to the sign just before Leo, the sign of Cancer the Crab, which contains the beautiful beehive cluster of stars. Now, using the open source planetarium app from Stellarium, we're going to locate the beehive cluster. Now, here we have the constellations that are going to help us find it. You can see starting from Orion and then Gemini, there's Cancer the Crab located right in front of Leo. Now, the nuzzle of Leo, his majestic mouth points right towards the two stars in the front of Cancer the Crab where we're going to locate the beehive in that little circle. So don't worry, we're going to actually zoom in. Maybe you can still make out the outline of Leo here. And I'm pointing from Leo's mouth to the front of Cancer the Crab, those two guiding stars in between them we're going to find the beehive. Don't worry, we're going to zoom in here. And as we do, the outline of Leo will also become more uh, vis uh, you can visualize it more easily. Okay, here's those two stars again. Cancer is a pretty faint constellation. That's why we're going to use the front of Leo the lion to find those two distinctive stars. That's Acellus Borealis, it means the northern donkey, and Acellus Australis. And in between them, we're going to find the beehive. Here's, here's Leo's majestic muzzle there in the front two stars point to Cancer and there's the beehive. Another ancient name for it was Praesepi. You may be able to read that in the upper left. It means manger. As we get in closer here, now you can really start to see the beehive. You can see it with the naked eye. You can see it with binoculars, really, really uh, dazzling with binoculars. Here's the northern donkey. The southern donkey, those are the front two stars of, of Cancer. In between those two is the beehive. Shortly after that episode, which we can now see to be directly based upon the sun's annual path, quote, down the hill, through Cancer, then Leo, then Virgo, we come to another very famous incident in the Samson myth. Samson's use of the jawbone of an ass to slay a thousand of his enemies. The authors of Hamlet's Mill make the memorable comment that, quote, Sunday school pupils must long have been puzzled about Samson's weapon of choice. Perhaps in the heat of the moment, someone might use a jawbone as a weapon, but would they continue to use it to slay 1,000 men, one at a time, one after another? Here, for a change, the authors of Hamlet's Mill come right out and explain their celestial interpretation of this event. They state that the jawbone weapon, which they also note, can be found in many cultures around the world. The, the mythology of many cultures around the world, including in many uh, sacred myths from South America and among the Maori of Aotearoa, or New Zealand, uh, this V-shaped jawbone weapon is none other, they, they, they tell us in Hamlet's Mill, than the V-shaped Hyades, which is a distinctive group of stars in the zodiac constellation Taurus over Orion's head, basically to the right when you look at him. Here's the layout in the sky. 
the authors of Hamlet's Mill state directly that, quote, Samson is Orion. In Judges 15, verse 15, we're told that Samson put out his hand to take the jawbone, and that is certainly consistent with this layout of the constellations of Orion and Taurus. If Samson is Orion, then he would be reaching out his hand to grab that V-shaped Hyades. But I actually disagree that Samson is simply Orion. I believe it's much more likely that Samson represents the sun moving through the zodiac signs, just as we've already seen. In this episode, he's moving through Taurus, very near to Orion, and this part of the story reflects that. One big clue that Samson is not one single constellation, but rather the sun, is the fact that scripture twice describes him as having seven locks of hair on his head. In the episode where, the, the probably the most famous episode of the Samson story, of course, that episode where Delilah is vexing him and pressing him to tell her his secret, which he finally gives in and, and tells her. It's very notable that the ancient sun gods are often depicted as having seven rays coming from their heads, and in at least one ancient poem, uh, the sun god is specifically described as having seven rays tied to his hair, or connected to his hair. So here's an ancient statue of the sun god Helios. You can count the rays coming from his head. Seven. And here's an ancient mosaic of the sun god Apollo. Again, seven rays. This connection to the seven locks of Samson's head, which are described twice in the Samson story in scripture. The seven locks of his head in conjunction with what we're about to examine, the specific incident of Delilah causing his seven locks of hair to be shaved, brings us directly to what I believe is the deeper answer to the riddle of Samson. You know, that riddle that Samson uh, challenged his 30 companions to try to understand what does all this mean? Well, I believe that just as with nearly all the other sacred myths in the ancient worldwide system, the story of Samson is not about events that happened to someone long ago or far away, and it's not even, in fact, about the motion of the sun or the other heavenly bodies. It's actually about you. That's right. It's about the experience of every human soul. The motion of the sun, in this case, is a metaphor of the experience of every human being who, at least according to the ancient system, comes down into material incarnation from the invisible realm of spirit and eventually returns to the realm of non-material spirit. Just as the sun and the planets and the stars also appear to move down below the horizon into the material world of earth and water and then back up into the realm of air and fire, the realm of spirit. When Delilah has Samson's hair shaved, the ancient scriptures describe him as becoming like one man or like any other man. And I believe this is the clue to the meaning. The divine nature, the sun, the divine nature, the, the heavenly spark plunges down into matter and becomes like an ordinary man or woman. Metaphorically, this happens at the western horizon each night, and metaphorically also, it happens at the autumn equinox each year. It's the cycle of the, the nightly cycle, also the annual cycle, also uh, it's found in other cycles, but in the annual cycle of the year, this plunging down of the sun to the lower half happens at the autumn equinox, and that's in the sign of Virgo. And that's why it's a beautiful woman who shaves off Samson's superhuman strength. That is, his divine nature. It, it, it gets shorn away from him as he plunges down. But then, the scriptures say, his hair began to grow again. Judges 16, 22. What this means is that here, in this material world, we at first, forget who we are. We're like 
Samson when he where like the sun has been turned into an ordinary man or woman. He's been shaved. We fail to perceive who we are, where we came from. We fail to perceive the invisible world of spirit that's all around us. It's within and behind everything in this material, physical world. But this loss, this amnesia, is supposed to be temporary. The hair, so to speak, is supposed to begin to grow back. We're supposed to start to call forth the spirit again within ourselves, to remember who we are, and to whatever degree possible, within others around us. We're supposed to remind them. And in fact, in all of creation, all of nature, bringing forth spirit, because all this natural realm is actually connected to and infused with the world of spirit as well. That is mana. That is chi. That is prana. That is spirit. That is a big part of what we're supposed to be doing here in this life in between the two pillars of the horizon down here in this lower half where our physical nature is grinding out its time just like Samson in the story where Samson he's ultimately crushed between the two pillars right that's where we are we're living in between those two pillars but that's actually the place where he triumphs ultimately by going through this life, uh, it's a triumph, it's a process that we're going through to raise the spirit. It's not a military triumph as in the literal story where he's killing his enemies. That's not his real triumph. This is a story about remembering who you are. That's why it's preserved here, to remind us who we are and of reconnecting with and raising the spiritual nature that's been cast down into incarnation in this physical realm. My name is David Matheson. Thank you for listening. Namaste and blessings.